When news first broke that China was dumping straw and planting millions of trees in its deserts, most of the world scoffed. Environmentalists warned it would flop, scientists called it a waste, and critics everywhere laughed. After all, who tries to plant a forest in the middle of a sandstorm? But a decade later those same voices have gone silent, and some are downright embarrassed. The Gobi Desert isn't just a little greener. What's happening there might change the way the entire world fights back against climate collapse. Are you ready for the biggest environmental twist you never saw coming? How China's land crisis turned into a national emergency. It's easy to forget just how fragile the world's largest countries can be. If you visited northern China in the early 2000s, you would have found a landscape at war with itself. The wind never stopped. Sometimes it arrived as a gentle, sand-laden whisper. Other days it screamed, ripping across half-barren steppe and farmland, carrying stinging dust for hundreds of kilometers until it finally rained down over Beijing, Seoul, even Tokyo. The deserts of northern China were growing at a rate that stunned scientists and terrified officials. The Gobi, that ancient sea of shifting dunes and stony barrenness, was marching south and east by as much as 3,000 square kilometers every year, a pace so relentless that entire villages, highways, and even cities found themselves teetering on the edge of a new environmental abyss. But this wasn't some slow-moving tragedy. For the people who lived in the path of the encroaching sands, it was a disaster happening in real time. Parents sent their children to school wearing surgical masks and goggles, hoping to spare them from the suffocating sand. Farmers stood at the edge of their fields and watched as their crops withered, their wells dried up, and their homes slowly disappeared beneath ever-thickening blankets of dust. Some families, trapped between the relentless desert and bureaucratic indifference, finally gave up. They packed their belongings, abandoned their ancestral homes, and joined the ranks of China's ecological migrants, the first of their kind anywhere in the world, forced to move not by war, but by the planet itself turning against them. How did things get this bad? For much of the 20th century, China's rise was built on extracting as much as possible from the land, with little thought for long-term sustainability. In the years after the founding of the People's Republic, population exploded. Forests were cut to provide fuel and building material, leaving entire provinces stripped bare. The vast grasslands of Inner Mongolia, once green and full of life, became overgrazed by surging herds of livestock. The government pressed millions of farmers to reclaim every available patch of earth, often in places where topsoil was already thin and rainfall scarce. As more land was cleared for farming, the vegetation that held the sand in check disappeared. Strong winds, especially during the bone-dry spring, scoured the exposed soil and carried it away, turning fields into barren dust bowls. For a time, the disasters felt local. But by the 1970s and 80s, it was clear that China's north had become ground zero for one of the largest episodes of desertification in recorded history. By the year 2000, over 2.6 million square kilometers of land, more than a quarter of the entire country, was considered degraded or at high risk of turning to desert. In the most affected regions such as Inner Mongolia, Ningxia, Gansu, and Xinjiang, Satellite imagery told a story of creeping loss. Green faded to yellow, yellow to brown, and brown to gray, until all that remained was shifting sand. The Taklamakan, known for centuries as the Sea of Death, was once again swallowing villages, trade routes, and roads that had survived since the Silk Road era. The effects rippled far beyond the desert's edge. Beijing, Tianjin, and other great northern cities found themselves bombarded each spring by dust storms so severe they turned day into night. The air choked with grit. Hospital admissions for respiratory problems soared. Sometimes the sandstorms grew so intense that particles crossed the Yellow Sea, turning the skies orange as far as South Korea and Japan. On rare occasions, scientists traced Chinese dust all the way across the Pacific, where it finally settled over San Francisco or Seattle. The human cost was staggering. It's estimated that as many as 400 million people lived in or near regions threatened by desertification. In bad years, millions were directly affected by sandstorms, losing crops, livestock, even entire homes. Wells ran dry, 
especially in places where groundwater was pumped recklessly to keep up with agricultural quotas. Farmers abandoned their fields. Small towns once bustling with life were reduced to dusty ghost villages, their residents forced into new cities or resettlement camps far from the only land they'd ever known. China became one of the first countries to officially recognize ecological migrants as a new kind of displaced population, families uprooted not by war or politics but by environmental collapse. The Gobi was no longer just a backdrop for epic tales. It was now on the move, a force threatening the very future of the nation. For China's government, the stakes went even deeper. In the early 2000s, the country was in the midst of an unprecedented economic boom. New highways, factories, and skyscrapers sprang up almost overnight. China was eager to present itself as a 21st century superpower, a master of technology and global trade. Yet behind the modern facade, the country was losing its battle against the ancient enemy of sand. Leaders in Beijing realized that unchecked desertification posed a direct threat to food security, economic stability, and even the legitimacy of the state itself. If the world's fastest-growing power couldn't protect its own land and people, what did that say about the promise of the Chinese dream? For years, the response had been a patchwork of local projects, windbreaks here, irrigation channels there, small-scale replanting schemes that slowed but never stopped the advance of the desert. It became clear that these piecemeal efforts were not enough. A bold national plan was needed, something big enough to match the scale of the crisis. Out of this desperation, the seeds of an audacious idea began to take root in the minds of Chinese planners and scientists. What if they could actually fight back against the desert? What if instead of retreating, they could plant a literal wall of green, hundreds of kilometers of forests, shrubs, and grasses stretching across the northern third of the country? The concept sounded like a fantasy, a new great wall, not of stone but of living trees, that would stabilize the land hold back the sand, and restore hope to the battered provinces of the north. The vision was staggering in scope. Planners imagined a shelter belt stretching over 4,500 kilometers in length, and as much as 1,500 kilometers in width. The project would reclaim more than 35 million hectares of land, transforming barren stretches into thriving ecosystems. This green Great Wall would be a living monument to human resilience a testament to the power of national mobilization and scientific innovation. But could such a scheme possibly succeed, especially in the face of mounting failures and international ridicule? Skeptics both inside and outside China were not shy about voicing their doubts. Foreign journalists derided the plan as burying money in the sand, and environmentalists warned that planting the wrong kinds of trees, or planting anything at all without changing water management practices, could actually make matters worse. Within China, some scientists pointed to the failures of past campaigns, arguing that the government's top-down, quota-driven approach was more about appearances than real ecological change. Local officials often cut corners to meet their tree-planting targets, resulting in monocultures that were vulnerable to pests, disease, and drought. In some places, planted forests died in droves, leaving behind eerie rows of dead trunks that served as monuments to well-intentioned but poorly executed ambition. Meanwhile, the desert pressed on. As each year passed, more land was lost and more families abandoned hope of ever returning home. Yet for all the skepticism, the crisis grew too dire to ignore. By the early 2000s, the government had begun to realize that fighting the desert required not just national willpower, but a new approach grounded in science local adaptation, and relentless trial and error.